I will uh, call this meeting to uh, order and first item is to adopt the agenda. I have a motion to adopt the agenda. Are there any additions? Are there any additions to the agenda? <laughs> Uh, I, I, I think no, sir. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I, I believe the uh, discussion from the special meeting was tabled for today. Is that for an in-camera discussion or is it over in the public here? It's so, so from staff, the recommendation would be to discuss any matters that are not necessarily related to legal or third party negotiations. Um, okay. That can be discussed outside of in-camera. However, the privacy piece, confidential items um, should be kept in an in-camera perspective and can be addressed at an in-camera meeting after. Is this um, on the agenda or no? It, it, it wasn't. If council wants okay. to make that call to add an item to the agenda, to the discussion. Okay. And so we'll add that. And where should we put that? The course and discussions. The what? Uh, I'm thinking 7B. If you want to okay. We'll call it 7B. Yep. And we'll deal with it then. So, uh, any further additions to the agenda? Seeing none, a motion to accept it as amended. Councillor Zelinski, Councillor Thompson, I don't think we need a second there. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Okay. Uh, 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 no, this little lady on the, on the uh, speaker. Oh, oh, I forgot about you. <laughs> You're looking well today. Oh, okay. Okay, so you voted to accept the agenda? Yes, I did. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, we have um, minutes from the Committee of the Whole, December 16th. Those committee minutes. Um, look to adopt those. I have an amendment or a clarification on the minutes. Okay, clarification on the minutes. Um, no, through you to um, our staff, the motion on my page five with respect to the art gallery. And it, the, the motion indicates that uh, the Committee of the Whole refers the fee for service at $8,000 from Gallery 2 to the budget process. Um, I have talked with uh, staff on this, and that was basically in reference to the um, uh, uh, dissolution of the Boundary Arts Council. And this, these were the funds that were um, generally on an annual basis granted to the Arts Council and the gallery is now going to take that function over at this time. So I don't know if we need to um, maybe just add that clarification to the to the minutes um, and maybe through you to, to Daniel, uh, Your Worship. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, so the, the Arts Council budget last year was $4,500 um, and the, um, with the dissolution of the BDAC, um, the, the Art Gallery was kind enough to take this on and distribute those funds for us. Uh, so there, but based on the feedback that they've received, there, there's definitely a higher need in the community for, for that kind of level of support. Um, I know council discussed the, the option of um, if it would be an Arts Council, then they would have access to other funding. Uh, the gallery isn't part of the Arts Council and can't be, so they don't, they are not able to leverage that funding against other provincial funding potentially. I, I know there was a, a question there. Uh, however, I don't think that that amount has ever been increased since, uh, since its inception. So um, it, it's going to be up to council, but uh, yes, clarification on that is definitely it's for that particular fee-for-service. The larger fee-for-service for providing the art gallery service is a completely different animal. Um, thank you. Uh, it just, when I first read it, I thought that that was what the request that was intended for the gallery the next ensuing year. So thanks for the clarification. And, and so maybe if council wants, um, we can simply add um, a component to the 
uh, discussion section there to clarify that this particular resolution was, is, is meant for the Arts, Arts Council piece and not for the larger yeah. Gallery 2 service. Okay, does that work? Councilor yes. Thompson? Yeah. Okay, so motion to adopt the uh, minutes of the 16th. Councilor Thompson, don't need a second there. Don't need one, but thank you, Councilor Korlek. Um, all those in favor? Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're at uh, presentations from staff, um, as I don't see any um, area D graph here. And we don't have any registered petitions or delegations. So we're looking at the monthly highlight reports. And um, the recommendation is that the committee of the whole receives the reports from the department managers. So I'm looking for that motion and discussion. Uh, motion, Councillor Thompson, discussion about the monthly reports. Anyone? Councillor Zielinski. Um, thank you. Uh, here. Um, through you to, to um, staff, I guess. The capital projects um, report, is this the way we're going to see them from now on? Because I know we were looking for more than this um, to keep us in, in tune with what's going on as far as the flood recovery stuff. So the last, uh, I think, three months, this is all that's said for the capital projects report. So. Thank you, uh, through the chair. Um, we, staff is uh, um, planning on adding more to this. Uh, the, the simple fact is we came back from holidays with a day to pull this particular report together and add it to the agenda. So this, this particular go around, we couldn't add more. Um, Mr. Dinsdale is preparing a workshop for council to get them caught up on the past projects. He's been for the last two or three months been involved with all the projects and trying to get a handle of where things are at, so um, you'll see better regular updates as part of this um, report over the next uh, month or two, I would say, once he's he's got a clear project charter on, on all the items and all the different projects that are ongoing so he can update council on a regular basis. And, and the workshop today is afternoon. Thank you. For the, yeah, I'm sorry, someone asked you. There, is that better? Um, just, uh, just about everything on the uh, current planning uh, um, heading. Uh, um, four industrial lots, small residential lots. Um, how are these proceeding? And uh, hopefully, we're going to get some new lots on on board here soon. Uh, just some comment, please. Mr. Deeper, would you like to? You have to push on your power button. Okay. Um, some of these are confidential, so we can't talk about them, but they're progressing uh, fairly well. There is one rezoning that's coming up uh, later on tonight at the regular meeting. Okay. And any news on the end of Boundary Drive? Uh, we rezoned and did some small lots at the north end of Boundary. Uh, how is that progressing? Uh, there is some discussion with the developer. It's uh, in his hands on uh, where that proceeds and when that proceeds. Thank you. Further? Uh, any other? Anyone in the gallery? Okay. So. Um, uh, the motion is to receive the reports. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Brings us up to item 7A, which is AKBLG resolutions. Do we have any? Um. Um, thank you through the chair. Um, so this this was a placeholder we put in for council. Um, I believe I sent an email out before the holidays to council to start thinking about this. Um, I believe at the end of January is when the deadline is for AKBLG resolutions. 
um, staff would just like to know if there's any any particular item we council would like to have prepped um, or if, if council has thought of any resolutions themselves to take forward for this year's AKBLG meeting in April. Okay. And Councilor Zelensky. Uh, thank you. Um, just to my colleagues here, uh, a couple things that have been mentioned. Um, I think uh, there was a suggestion on the um, Expropriation Act where we yeah. thought that there, there could be enhancements there. Um, <laughs> I know we were trying to, the medical community and trying to support some of their issues. Yeah, I haven't had any meeting with them yet. Okay. Um, other than that, the, the ones that we did have carried forward already, I don't know if there's any uh, additional stuff we can do on them. I, I haven't heard the government response on, on them yet, but that, that's okay. all. Right. Councillor Moslin. Yes. Thanks, Chair. I, 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 I was wondering, and it, and it, ha it has come up, is this the, the responsibility for um, emergency weather or extreme weather? Well, we have already forwarded a motion to the RDKB uh, from this council that they start to examine the possibility of adding extreme weather to emergency responsibilities. Uh, we mentioned it, we have mentioned it in discussions mm -hmm. recently. Uh, would, it, would it be appropriate to ask staff to, you know, I, I know there is a who manages what in an emergency is kind of complicated and the scope of what they manage is also sort of set in stone but we are beginning to put I, I think we are council is that you know there are more emergencies than flood water <coughs> flood fire and drought and, and perhaps extreme weather uh, might become inclusive in uh, some sort of regional in initiative Councillor Thompson. Thank you. I know that um, under the Extreme Weather Act and its accompanying regulations that the minister can declare yes. um, an extreme weather and I don't believe that that has occurred yet for our area. Um, I also believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, please staff, um, can the council declare that as well or is that a different Okay, um. it, it's a number of people that could, could do it. Sometimes service providers uh, uh, can do it. Um, I'm not aware of, of council doing that. Um, again, it's usually a provincial thing and or a provider uh, in town. If there's someone that's you know designated that makes that call that the temperatures drop below a certain uh, point. But I think looking at extreme weather uh, as part of your emergency operations is important because remember uh, a lot of things can happen around the province today uh, there's communities that are now freezing without power <laughs> uh, and, if, and if the power went out throughout the whole city uh, is there a place with a generator that could be housed so that people could go to that facility and at least be warm uh, for any citizen uh, so, I, so I think having that plan having that ability to enact something should you have not only cold weather but ice storms and, and another thing um, so, so I, I think so certainly by going back and asking uh, the regional district to to work well with the community so that in fact you have a warming center for the community if all the power is out and it's going to blow up. Right? Hang on one sec. Um, Mr. Johnson. Uh, okay, I'll point out another one. In 2015, we had a smoke emergency here, and I found out, which somebody pointed at me, we have a CDC in this problem, province, and the CDC specifically has documents that advise municipalities and other things, other entities, on how to deal with a smoke emergency. For over a week, people with asthma couldn't go outdoors, or they were told they had to leave town. And there definitely is guidelines on how to do the same thing for a smoke emergency that you do for bad weather. In other words, create a place where people who are, have a hard time breathing can go and get a place to breathe and up to the information and a whole bunch of other things. And that didn't happen here and it hasn't happened since. And I'm, I don't know whether any community in the province has taken that seriously or even if it's on their radar. But we didn't burn, but we sure as hell had a lot of smoke. That's it. Thank you. I felt it. 
Councillor Zelensky. Excuse me for using that word. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, to staff again, so uh, we don't have a, a um, up-to-date agreement with RDKB for running the emergency operations. How is that uh, negoti negotiation going? Uh, thank you, through the chair. Um, through the um, changes on the fire department side, which is also the emergency uh, coordinator for um, the city, um, Mr. Siegler is going to take this on this year along with the RD. Um, I talked with uh, Mr. Chandler at the RDKB side in November when we had a conference call. I tried to have another conference call before this today so I could update council on any RDKB relations, but uh, that hasn't happened yet, so I can't. Um, but the plan is on the RD side, they have added it to their work plan to get this done this year. Um, it, it largely hinges on the RDKB because it is a regional response plan. Um, they are taking feedback from all the um, emergencies that we had over the years, including the flooding event um, and the outcomes and um, debriefs uh, that were had to, to build a new response plan based on that. So. If council would want to, we can definitely bring up extreme weather as part in part of those uh, negotiations and have the or not even negotiations discussions and have them include a portion of this at least. Um, maybe this would also work with a potential community center down the line that uh, there is a provision maybe made where something could be used there. Okay. Follow up. Yeah. Follow. Up. Uh, thank you. Um, so doesn't sound like we're going to have an agreement in place with RDKB before flood season. Can we make sure we have a letter of an understanding, even if That's something in place? One works. Uh, yeah, through the chair. Yes, we can. We can easily um, get a letter in place, some some memorandum of understanding to continue using, or letter of understanding continue using the old plan at least. So so we're all on board with the same process. Okay, one one second before Councillor Moslin. Um, yes, extreme weather. The one that hasn't been mentioned is heat as well. So um, to get back to the topic, which is AKBLG resolution, um, I believe that yes, we should flesh out something. My question through me <laughs> to the staff is, um, what deadline does staff have? AKBLG is the end of January, but staff needs time to prep. So what is staff's deadline for council resolutions? Today? Uh, I, I, well, uh, that's why I sent the email out before the holidays uh, to, for council to think about things. So uh, ideally, if council can, can bring something forward for the meeting on the 27th. Um, in, in the past, some members of council have prepped uh, their own items um, uh, to bring forward and discuss. Uh, if council wants to do that for the evening on the 27th to bring um, a few resolutions and make a decision of what they want. If, if council wants staff to prepare something, uh, give us some guidance today to what you would like to see so we can prep something as well for the 27th and council can um, at that point make a decision to go forward or not with a certain item. Okay. Councilor Moslin. Yes, uh, Chair, thank you. Yes, Chair. Thank you. I cert I, it is, I believe, an AKBLG issue because it's not just a RDKB, but it's the other two regional districts as well. And um, uh, I know that uh, in the Social Services Advisory Group in discussions with Nelson Cares, uh, <coughs> Central Kootenai Regional District, they did talk about you know having some sort of emergency response plan at the regional level. So I, I feel that uh, I'm speaking in favor of some sort of motion, uh, j just simply to put it on the plate of AKBLG so that all three of our regional districts realize that there is a bit of a gap here in our emergency services having to do with extreme weather. In the past, there was such a thing as an extreme weather response plan, uh, which is well delineated and it's usually held by a provider. And when the trigger got arrived at, the button got pushed, yeah. everything fell into place. We don't have that. And uh, I think maybe, and, I, and, I, and I'm apprehensive that something so important would be in the hands of a service provider. When you're talking about a natural phenomenon, one would think that uh, it would be better in the hands of government. 
So I, I, I hope that we can bring forward some sort of motion about extreme weather to the regional level. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, to sum up and before we move on, I think. Um, I just want to say before you yes. do, um, I do believe there is extreme weather and different emergency situations that are at regional district now, but it certainly yeah. wouldn't hurt to have the representatives and Mr. Mayor or myself take it again and just uh, emphasize the importance of getting working together to make this uh, an area-wide initiative because I think it's really important. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Councillor Korolek. Um, basically, to um, recap, what we need is ongoing um, discussions with the regional district for our specific area. We need to um, have a motion go to AKBLG to get us the our whole area again onto um, the same plan and then that goes to the UBCM hopefully and then the province so that the province realizes that they can't just say oh you should have a plan that they should um, put some manpower and money into it so that everyone in the province has a plan because the weather's not going to get any better <laughs> so uh, Councillor Thompson yeah I think that's an excellent idea um, and through you to Councillor Malton, do you have an example of the um, that plan that you were referring to that nope. we could, we could yeah. give to our, our uh, staff or whoever is going to prepare that motion? Yes. Uh, uh, yes, Your Worship. Okay. I, do, I do have that uh, extreme weather response plan from 2016-2017 for our community. <coughs> it's, it's not active now. There's a gap. That's the okay. concern. But that background information would go, at, and we'll also work on the um, motion amongst ourselves to help staff. Okay. So, so, oh, to, um, thank you, through the chair. So, so just to, to quickly clarify, um, council would like us to focus simply on on this particular extreme weather related uh, scenario to ADA KBLG, but also potentially to a larger provincial level um, and, and to keep discussions flowing with the RDKB on a continuous basis right now in the until these larger things develop on a provincial level yes and and the mayor councillor Korlek can um, also <laughs> the RD at their meeting of the direction that we're going and, and what we would like to see. Okay. okay. Um, flip that over. Okay, so um, that was just a discussion. So, oh, do we need a motion? Does staff need a motion yet? I don't know. No. So we'll be looking at our um, deadline on or before the 27th. Um, for this one, as much before, but we'll be doing that decision on the 27th. There are a couple of other issues that that we should be bringing forward to, so we'll work on those. Okay, so now we're down to 7B. Does somebody want to introduce that? Councillor Zelensky. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, pro probably uh, this came at my uh, aiding on, I guess, if nothing else, so I might as well start the discussion. Um, so, the officer's bylaw that we have presented uh, to us this morning is uh, pared down from what the current oh, one is. Can I? Can I? Uh, we're on seven. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. sorry the, um, the shelter, the warning center. Sorry. sorry, that was probably my confusion uh, there. <laughs> so, is anybody want to, or can leave it up to me to start it? Mm -hmm. but, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't know what to say there. Um, we've been, the city has been approached. Um, by a provider um, for a um, to run a warming center, um, especially with the uh, recent <coughs> drop in temperatures, 
and um, the request that would come to council would be to allow it to um, operate in the um, 7500 Tongson. Okay, so that's what we've been um, asked about. Would we um, consider allowing that, or not allowing it, um, not enforcing, I guess, or, or uh, bylaw? Councillor Zelinsky. Uh, thank you. Um, so I, I haven't seen any proposals. So, um, if a cold weather emergency shelter is to be run, it'd be nice to know what the rules are around it. And we haven't seen that as Mr. Pratt walks into the room. <laughs> so, um, so that's one of my concerns. Uh, my, my, my bigger concern, and it, it always has, and I'll try and be brief because uh, people have heard me say this many, many times before, is I believe it's very imperative that we follow our bylaws and we enforce our bylaws. Um, if we do not, if council does not follow their own bylaws, um, I don't know what kind of a society we have then. Um, we are uh, a, a country of laws. Uh, we expect certain um, behaviors and people to follow the rules. We have built our rules, our bylaws, in such a way that they can be changed, that they can be altered, and that allows us to go through time as things change. Um, we, we have a, um, we had some, some documentation given us um, from Community of Futures that talk about investment readiness. There's a real big chunk in there about um, cities, communities following their rules so that when people, investors look at your community, they know that know what to expect. Once we do not follow the rules, that's when the slippery slope, slope happens, and all of a sudden it's someone's decision whether or not we, you know, we follow the rules or not. I would hate that to roll over to the taxpayer saying, well, if the council isn't following the rules, why should I? Why should I pay my taxes? Why should I pay my electrical bill? Heck with you jumping the, the, the snow on the sidewalk. So it's, again, it's, in my view, it's very important that we follow those rules and we have mechanisms to change them. And I'll leave that back, thank you. For the Councillor Thompson. <clears throat> uh, yes, I, <clears throat> I totally agree um, with what <coughs> Councillor Zelinsky has said. However, this is uh, an emergent situation. <clears throat> um, the proposed provider is, uh, in my opinion, uh, an acceptable provider that would, would uh, operate such a facility uh, with rules and regulations. I find it absolutely regrettable that um, 7500 Donaldson Drive was opened last night. Having said that, I realized that there were people at risk. Um, <clears throat> the winds last night uh, um, woke me up. And uh, um, I thought, holy man, that doesn't Well, what can I say? It's just, uh, it's a really unfortunate situation. Um, yes, I do believe that council is responsible to follow its, its bylaws and the laws of the province and the country. However, in an emergent situation such as this, <coughs> which in my opinion it is, um, through the mayor to to our, um, our management, are there exceptions that we as a council can either by resolution or uh, some other means 
deal with these types of situations um, immediately? Or do we have to go through the process and, and allow people to be on their own and fend, their, fend for themselves? Anybody want to get your after crack at it? Thank you, Rochelle. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think when we look at um, all these types of situations, we recognize that you know, it's not a perfect world. And uh, um, I would argue that in any given city, at any given day, at any given time, uh, there's, there's things that aren't complying with our bylaws. We don't have enough bylaw officers, lawyers, and money to enforce every bylaw at every moment. And that's just a general statement. There's also times where things don't fit, but people are also allowed time to comply. And uh, we, we give those, those uh, because bylaws can be complex, you've all been seasoned, and sometimes things change, and we don't sit there and go through every piece of land every minute of every day to make sure it's always compliant. So I think there's always a gap between what is happening in reality on the day-to-day -day and those bylaws. And there's a big difference, I think, um, you know, in that you can't necessarily enforce all the time. And we're dealing with an extreme weather situation. I don't think anyone, certainly no one on the staff, thought that necessarily opening that facility was the first choice when we, when we were asked, you know, is there something that could be done? Uh, hotel program was, was tried, motel program was tried last year. Uh, didn't quite get off the ground, um, and and so really was. Is there anybody to step up? Council's always concerned about a provider. One of the first criteria council said before supporting anything was a solid provider that they could trust and the community could trust. So here we have you know Boundary Family Services as a, as a provider, not necessarily in this line of work, but they've come forward, uh, staking their own reputation to help out in this emergency situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they came forward. And the second thing that happens is, you know, where, so where are we going to do it? We're working with BC Housing, and not not the city per se, but with BC Housing. And, and where would you put it? Well, that's that was the site that they could literally turn the key on, to turn on the heat, and uh, get some people out of the cold. And so now the real question for council is, um, you know, what what are you going to do about it? As I said, every day there are bylaws that are aren't being followed, but what are you prepared to do? And uh, Your Worship, I think at this point in time, since it is 15, 16 below outside, you know, I think the important thing is to is to let Boundary Family Services see if we can keep these people out of the cold for the next uh, uh, period of time and, and, and to monitor the situation every day. I, I can tell you there are acutely aware of the concerns and the criticism and, and, and the problems in the past. So it's not as if they're, they're you know, not aware of that. I think they're going to try real hard. Um, and that leads to then what you do in the future. And I think what it, what it leads to is to be able to um, get the situation monitored, make sure the community is safe, if there's problems in the community, let's know what they are right up front. Is there, other things we need to do to, to make that site they need to do and BC Housing needs to do because it won't be the city. Um, and then get the, get a plan in place to do this properly through either a TIP TUP, uh, through a proper site. If there's going to be a shelter, then that comes through as a rezoning and, and those. The exact same type of thing you do with any somebody else who wasn't in compliance, I don't think this council would shut them down the next day and say, okay, how do we bring this into compliance uh, and allow people to do So, Your Worship, my, my recommendation at this point is to see if you could make this work, at least in the short term, get them off the street. Uh, right now, we have problems in the library, people trying to sleep in the library. Um, you know, they're, they're, there's greater risk to the community having people trying to find their own emergency shelter wherever they can do it than necessarily having a, a provider that we trust be able to try to take a crack at this. So it's a difficult situation. No one's asking council to break the law. But certainly at this point, if um, we step through it, we could actually bring this into compliance at some point in time. And, and ultimately, council has the right to enforce the bylaw if they choose. I have uh, Mr. Johnson. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to lock my little bleeding heart up in a box. I'm not even going to touch it here. 
Can you? I'm, I'm a tax. Okay, right I'm a taxpayer here, Les Johnson, GFTV.ca, but I am a taxpayer. I'm not sure how many people in C4 are taxpayers, but the reason I bring that up is simple. With all of the things that our community is going on right now, and Jay Daniel just passed me the mic, people are going to think I'm a council member. You um, are. <laughs> no, no, you think I'm a council member. <laughs> anyway. You think you are. <laughs> Please, could you please. get the gallery to stop talking directly to me? Talk to me through the mayor, please. Then don't talk to her, please. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> last year we had a warming center and it was funded not by the citizens of the city but by another organization, another high level <coughs> government. But apparently that was not good enough. I mean, I know that it was in the summertime and people didn't like it, but the reason I bring this up is simple. There was a guy last year, was it the year before, he lost a couple of toes to frostbite. But we had a warming center. We didn't get sued. Now, in the intervening time, what has council done? Well, council has gone and pretty much enforced the bylaw on the facility. But you know, up that same side of Donaldson, there's at least two, three other places where people live. They actually live there 24 hours a day, year round, and as far as I know, Council did not enforce the bylaw on them. Maybe their grandfather, I don't know. But my problem with this is simple. Because council enforced the bylaw selectively like that, some lawyer would have good ammunition. And if some homeless person gets frostbite and loses some digits or a limb or something like that, now what happens is we as taxpayers in this community are on the hook for any liability and lawsuit that comes from that. You may think, oh, no big deal. You know, why would some homeless person get a lawyer? They can't afford a lawyer. I mean, I can't even afford a lawyer to go after the people who I think are libeling me. That's a side issue. But here's the thing. One lawsuit that results in a $50,000, $75,000, $100,000 claim against the city, that's 2% extra on my property taxes that didn't have to be there because you know, if we had a warming shelter that was paid for by some other organization, there would be no money coming in my pocket. Now, if the person in, in, in question who got frostbite was a young person and their brain was not already rotted away by drugs, meaning that they, some lawyer could give them a reasonable argument that would be for another 40 years of earning power, the judgment could run into, oh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, and that would be borne by me that taxpayer, and all of you. And I have no idea how many people who are in the group that opposes all this and has been driving for all this stuff to be done slowly, I don't know how many of them are taxpayers in this city, but I am, and it ticks me off. That's okay, it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Um, Johnson. Um, I have, oh, here, here, what? Oh, there sorry. you go. I have uh, Councillor Zelensky, but just one note. Um, no, we would not be sued. Oh, or, or no, I can't say that. We could be sued, but it has no relevance on the city. So, Councillor Zelensky. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to rebut a few of the, the comments. Uh, the city's policy is we act on complaints. So. The, so we did have a complaint on that building. The other buildings mentioned by the gallery, I have not heard any complaints on. So we're a complaint-driven uh, thing. Um, we're also talking about, yes, it's an emergency now, and, um, and we've got to do something. To the unfortunate part is we knew this a year ago. It was brought up this table at this table a year ago. And one little saying that I go by quite a bit is uh, someone's poor, poor planning should not create an emergency on my part. Um, yeah, I spoke with this Why well, yesterday, thank you. I have Ms. Palmer and then Thompson and then a hand in the back. Okay. Ooh, hi. Okay, Councillor Thompson. Or no, sorry. Ms. Palmer. I'd like to rebut a couple of the things. I have a whole bunch of freedom of information requests that I got from BCH. The reason the motel program fell apart was because Brian Taylor got involved and that's why it fell apart. Um, otherwise it probably would have been up and running and doing just fine. 
Um, also, in regards to the gentleman who lost his toes, unless there were two people that lost their toes, he was insisting on wearing steel-toed boots, even though he was offered warm winter boots, and he refused to go into a warm shelter. So I'm thinking that was his choice. Um, just saying. Thank you. Um, Councillor Thompson. <coughs> Oh, there I am. Okay. <laughs> um, with respect to the shelter last year, um, <clears throat> that was an emergent situation as well. And we understood that it was going to be closed at the end of April, or pardon me, the end of March. Uh, regrettably, it morphed into something more than that. Uh, and that was when um, council <coughs> took the action that they did. It is my understanding that this extreme weather shelter would operate only until the end of March. And um, I, I, I have faith in the provider that there will be rules and regulations and uh, no none of the um, carryings on that were experienced last year by any of the residents. So um, I would, I, I'm going to say that I'm going to support the continuation of that uh, extreme weather shelter from now until the end of March, operated by a, in my opinion, qualified service provider. Okay, in the back. This might sound like a funny question, but I was just wondering oh, how sorry. long. Can, did you identify yourself? Nikki Best, resident of Grand Forks, yeah. taxpayer. Um, how long and what are the steps that it takes to change a bylaw? It's really me to staff. What are the steps and how long? Uh, Your Worship, there's a statutory requirement for public uh, notice, and so that's usually where it takes the time before you have a public hearing. Put the application in, could take a month or two if you fast track it because it has to be published in uh, the newspaper and those types of things. That's what usually takes the time. So, and how come um, the service provider is being kept quiet? Why is there no name provided as to the service provider as of yet? The service provider was named earlier and it's um, FIS or the FIS, Boundary Family individual services your, your, your Mr. Worship, uh, the and individual was dropped two years ago we're boundary family services oh okay so that um, does that answer your question thank you Ms. best okay um councillor maz <laughs> thanks your worship um I, I, I agree with Councillor Thompson, uh, although there is no motion on the floor. I, I would like to support Boundary Family Support Services as a qualified provider who has dug hard amongst themselves to have the courage to come forward to provide this temporary service for our community. Our community does benefit under, I understand the immediate neighborhood, there will be impacts. <coughs> but other parts of the community will benefit. Well, and as counselors, we have to weigh that. And so it is not easy. It's never easy. <coughs> I find that we can, I, I believe that I can in good conscious, conscience, suspend the enforcement of the bylaw until March 20th or March 2020, the end of March 2020, <coughs> in order to provide humanitarian relief to those in coal. I also, even more importantly, want to show my support for Boundary Family Services as they take this task on and face even more daunting tasks in the future as the provider for the uh, affordable housing unit on 19th, as, which is a new service for them. 
okay, uh, and as well as uh, their regular services. So I, I, I want, I would like to thank them for having the courage to, to uh, undertake this. I personally want to show my support for them. I, I, I'm trusting that the Social Services Advisory Committee uh, will bring forward its support for this temporary plan and that as a community to get all together we can make this work. Thank you, Your Worship. Councillor Thompson. <clears throat> I just wanted to say that, to add rather, that um, this service would be funded through BC Housing, um, but they won't fund without the support of Council uh, <clears throat> supporting the, uh, the service provider. So that's uh, another area that Council has to become involved in. Councillor Zielinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the, the, the planning process, the, 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 the big thing and about this is the chance for the public, the community, to voice their concern on that service at that location. We have a location. People should be able to comment. We don't know what the service is, again, I haven't seen a document to say whether it's eight to eight, whether it's you know we heard March thirtieth, uh, you know if it if it's twenty above on March fifteenth, uh, is that still okay? Is it now a cooling center again? So it's 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 cutting out the public from voicing their opinions on a different type of service for the community. That's the problem with doing this ad hoc. Is we have said that we're going to try to be a transparent council, we're going to be an open council, and part of that process is the ability for the public to comment. And that's what th is getting cut out of this. We could have had this discussion a long time ago. So that's, that's the problem, is this is not a democratic, uh, politically driven uh, process at this time. It's a dictatorship. It's, this service is going there. And that's probably the biggest thing that um, I'm concerned about. Councillor, oh, sorry, um, Ms. Palmer. Um, I have a question regarding, um, I understand that Mayor Taylor has been discussing stuff with RDKB. Um, RDKB stepped up and opened up the arena rooms, they opened up um, the curling rink, all sorts of stuff during the flood and in an emergency situation like this I'd like to know why the curling rink has washrooms, it's got a warm facility upstairs, why that was not opened up for this emergent situation put into public rooms and then can be closed when the emergency is no longer around. Sorry, I can't answer that. The only person that could probably is not here. No, and so, I can't either. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, yes. Yeah. Apparently, it was brought up to regional district, and they didn't go very far. And that's all I can say on that one. Councillor Moslin. Yeah. First, your 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 worship. I I too do not like doing this ad hoc. I, I too feel a great deal perhaps of shame that, that I've had we've had a year to not have to do this ad hoc and here we are nonetheless we do have this humanitarian, humanitarian crunch I want to point out that the public has been involved through the social services advisory crew which has met at least once a month, and some months two or three times, in open public meetings with the press there to discuss these the possibilities, including the arena and the curling rink. I do want to remind you that when the or most of the during the flood of May 18, 2018, most of the other programs within those buildings were suspended. So it was a lot easier to provide emergency relief. In the situation now, 
No, all, most of those programs are still continuing. So it's a lot less easy to provide relief. Indeed, the Social Services Advisory Group, if you read the minutes, which are publicly available, has been casting around through churches and different community groups looking for a location and a provider. We have, we have been looking for, for, for literally for months. Well, I, I, you know, if I had a New Year's resolution, one of them would be to never have to do this ad hoc again. That there be an emergency response, weather, extreme weather response plan, a qualified provider, and a designated location for this event. Yes, I, I, that would be my resolve again. I, and I am embarrassed to say that it didn't happen this year. Despite we have worked, Councilor, we have really tried uh, well, with our community to find a solution. I, 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 you know, Mr. Pratt has chaired those meetings, uh, the Boundary Family Support Services has indeed been their meeting as we've cast it around uh, with a lot of community help from different groups including Citizens Four, who worked, re worked really hard on that at that committee level. <coughs> so it, ha it has been democratic, uh, in my opinion. It hasn't been fruitful. I hate the ad hoc. I hate the last minute. I resolved that it will not happen again. With that in mind, I believe I can, in good conscience, not enforce our bylaws till the end of March 2020 to allow humanitarian relief uh, of the operation of an extreme weather shelter plan. One other point, I believe the details of that plan as well as the management of that plan are going to become public in time. In fact, I, don't, I think it's going to be a very short time uh, with the meeting of the uh, Grand Fork Social Services Advisory Group on Wednesday to discuss this, which will be in public. I, I hope that we take the t 10 weeks to establish a plan that works, to make changes after studying the impacts uh, on the neighborhood, reaching out to the neighborhood that we can have an even better plan for January 2021. Those are my comments, Mayor, thank you. Okay, I have um, Ms. Palmer and then Councillor Zelensky. Um, I sit on the Grand Forks SSA team and I'd just like to say, and I've said it there before and I'll say it again, if you've got more than two people knowing something that's going on, then it's going to get out because nobody can keep a secret. And there have been so many backroom deals going on behind the scenes in that group, it's impossible to say that that's been an honest working group. Um, the other thing I would like to know is I'd like to know what impact this is that you have a court case happening with the owner of this building and yet you're willing to let the bylaws slip, which tells pretty much everybody in Grand Forks that bylaws don't count anymore. You can do what you like. Um, and how are you going to work on that one? Councillor Zelensky. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I thought I heard Councillor Mosden say that the Grand Forks Social Services Advisory Committee is the sounding voice for the community on this topic. And I disagree with that. The fact that we had a email that I think I shared with everyone that the seniors group wanted to get involved and they were told no sure. uh, you'll have to ask the group as a whole they were they, they did were ask and they have been admitted they have been, and, and, and that's great but that's still um, that, that's not our process that is not a local government process absolutely you're right so so we have different things put in place for the public uh, um, comment 
you know, we, we had a, a member of the gallery ask us about the, uh, the planning uh, process and, and I, I'll agree with the, our, our uh, CAO about two months. But I, I haven't seen an application that staff has for rezoning of a building. I haven't seen anything as far as what an emergency, emergency shelter is as opposed to a warming center as opposed to another shelter. We don't know what we're talking about. We don't have any hours of operations. We don't know any of that. And I, it's a simple process, and in the scheme of things, a two-month process to clear up all of this stuff, to me, seems very minor, in my books, anyway. Um, so, again, you know, the service providers, the people concerned about having this service in our community, uh, know the steps, know the planning process, and did not follow through, and that's what confuses me, is as a, a member, a public member of this community, when things change in your community, you know, um, we should allow an opportunity for voicing those opinions, and um, I've, seen, <laughs> I've seen too many protests on the steps of the City Hall than I care to, because of the transparency issue, of the openness issue that we don't seem to be following through on. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ebern, Ebern Studley, and then I have Mr. Noseworthy, and then the front, and then Councillor Thompson. Yeah, my main concern, of course, the whole process. Council does work by process. Sometimes those processes are long. Ideally, I'd like to see temporary use permit or something like that. That does take time, unfortunately. We're sort of out of time. Um, then my other main concern is with uh, the court cases. I'm not going to get into the detail of that uh, there is litigation there, but most of the town does know that there is litigation on that property. Um, my gut definitely tells me that um, not enforcing the bylaw will add more fuel to that fire, unfortunately. So, thank you, um, Mr. Noseworthy. Thank you. Um, I'm not a public speaker, but I have a couple things that I have to say and a couple questions I'd like to ask. Did this council approve the opening of the warming center last night? No. No. Yeah. Then how did it become open? Magic. Uh, you're going to have to ask Mayor Taylor. Okay, well, it'd be nice if he was here because this is a pretty important meeting. Yeah. Um, also, I'd like to know how much city taxpayer dollars is going into this process before BCH steps up? Zero. Zero? Yeah. That's guaranteed? Yeah. It's <laughs> Other than staff, Other than, Yeah, sorry. So, that so it's not zero? Yeah, that's not zero. Okay, thank you. Time. Okay. Um. okay. So I'm Bronwyn Bird. I'm a resident and taxpayer of Grand Forks. First, I just want to say how I'm really was glad to hear Councillor Thompson and Councillor Moslin and their support for this. I'm also, on the other hand, extremely disappointed in some councillors who are so hung up on process. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm an elected official too. I believe in process. Process is needed for certain things. But this is an emergency situation. Would you want to be standing outside last night in those winds? Probably not. So although process is important and we have bylaws for a reason, sometimes you need to understand that emergency takes over. And I can guarantee you there are many places in this town that are not following the bylaws. And if it is complaint driven, as counselors, you can make those complaints and have those bylaws enforced. But I'm pretty sure you're not doing that. So if you're gonna enforce the bylaw here, then maybe you should start making complaints about other places that are not following the bylaw. Because that's just a double standard. And I also have to say I'm pretty disappointed in some of the people in this town. Like, I was on Facebook last night, which is a dark hole, and the people who are posting on Facebook certainly don't represent me and the resident that I am. Because some people were calling individuals who need an emergency shelter 
not part of our community, that they should basically pitch a tent and light it on fire. That is deplorable. I can't believe people would say that, that these people are not a part of our community. They are a part of our community. And I just, I'm not one of those kind of people. That is not Grand Forks, in my opinion. I cannot believe that people would say that. I completely support, I'm going to voice my opinion here, I completely support this emergency shelter. Because these homeless people, or any individual who needs a place to stay in the cold, they are a part of our community. They're human beings, for Christ's sake. And to say that they should just pitch a tent, I'm sorry, that's just disgusting. Thank you. Or is there further? That's it. Okay. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Oh, thank you. Just a couple of comments. Um, I sit on the Grand Forks Social Services Advisory Group, and I have never been part of a backroom deal. Uh, I don't. I don't work that way. Uh, secondly, um, we could leave those people in their uh, circumstances uh, that they were in, and God forbid we lose another life, either through freezing to death or through uh, a fire as a result of them trying to keep warm. Uh, I appreciate the fact, that, and this is a public process, the public has been given the opportunity here which is why this has been placed on, the, on this agenda, to speak to the issue. Um, I hear your complaints uh, and your concerns, and, um, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to hear you. Um, all of the decisions that I make are not going to please everybody, um, and uh, uh, and council, as you can you can tell from this discussion, isn't uh, in um, in support or, or unified in, in in the decision making process. However, I am going to put forward the following resolution, and that is uh, and and staff can help me with my wording if if need be. That um, council will suspend enforcement of its bylaws as it relates to 7500 Donaldson Drive until March 31st, 2020. One point of order. Yeah. Uh, whether or not it's a recommendation to the regular yeah. meeting? Yes. Okay, sorry. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. So your motion would be to uh, recommend the council. Recommend Council and then that decision yeah. would be made tonight. That's right. Is there a seconder for that motion? Oh, sure. uh, oh, don't need one. But thank you, Councillor Mosley. Uh, yeah. Through uh, through me to you, uh, Your Worship. Just to clarify the zoning, I think specifically zoning, not all. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Particularly the zoning bylaws. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and you may want to add just for assurance of that. But you know that the, the matter be monitored throughout that process, mm -hmm. okay. um, which at least allows that adjustment. Daniel, um, and, and not not regarding the resolution, but um, we do have an in-camera meeting scheduled after this. Um, we have scheduled a phone call with legal counsel, um, as I advised counsel last night in an email, um, to be taking place during that to answer any sort of legality questions. Um, I've also arranged for Mr. Pratt to be here for that in-camera meeting as well to speak to the, the uh, rules and processes. Um, I, he won't be able, I won't be able to share these with the public, but I can share a document with counsel in that in-camera meeting because the documents haven't been approved yet by his board. So there is some confidentiality there. We have to keep this confidential, um, but they can be shared about the, and Mr. Pratt is gonna be able to speak more openly during that meeting about the timelines uh, and, and so on, and, and opening hours and, and whatnot that he is envisioning for the site. Um, it's just not possible at this stage outside of the in-camera meeting. I apologize, but that's just where we're at. So I hope this will help council make a good informed decision tonight if that's possible yeah, yeah. 
Councillor Zelensky addressing the um, the motion. Yes, yeah. um, and, and that, that and that's my concern is again without anything in front of me, not knowing rules, not knowing hours of operation, not knowing staffing levels, um, all that. It, it's it's a black hole. So so um, um, and you said in camera today after this. Yeah, after this. Okay, thank you. Councillor Thompson. Uh, I'm just referring the, the the matter to the regular meeting of council tonight. So okay. if somebody could be so kind as to read back the resolution and with all the nice words put in memos. Sorry, I wasn't listening. <laughs> okay, can, we put, can we put it up on the screen? Mm -hmm. uh, can you give me a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, got all the time in the world. Okay, while, while, um, <laughs> at least a year anyway. McKinnon works on typing that in. Um, yeah, a uh, couple of things. Um, we needed three things to get funding for a shelter we needed a provider, we needed a location, and we needed um, council approval, I guess, for one of a better word. Okay, so since that time we now have um, a group stepping forward to be the provider. Uh, location is, is an issue because again, we're hit with the 11th hour and um, just like last time it opened as a warming center, it was a surprise to the community as a whole. Um, we were, or I was invited to an in-camera meeting yesterday, and um, this decision possibly could have been made yesterday and we would have been exactly the same as the previous and exactly the same as when BC Housing did a surprise on 2nd Street. Um, so in that meeting, the discussion um, was referred to this meeting so it could take place in public. So it's, it's not a backroom deal. Now, uh, it is regrettable that the, um, uh, the facility opened um, without um, that consent. Okay, are we there yet? Okay. Does that? That's so, I'll read it out. If the Committee of the Whole recommends to Council to suspend enforcement of zoning bylaws regarding 7500 Donaldson Drive to permit the use of the location as a cold well, as a, I would say, extreme weather shelter until March 31st, 2020 and that the use of this site be monitored. And is that just until March? Some, sorry, somebody brought up the fact that what if it's 20 degrees in March? So on or before, does that address that? Well, I think BC Housing, I believe BC Housing funds on a monthly basis. So, um, uh, Daniel would like to say something. Um, so I, I, I believe Mr. Pratt may also be able to speak to his, his board's willingness um, uh, to how long to support um, the operations as a provider for that facility. But I don't, I don't know if he can do it in a public meeting or if it has to be in the in-camera. So I, I believe a uh, date is uh, no longer than March 31st at the moment for, for all organizations involved. Okay, does Mr. Pratt want to agree with that or say anything or? Yeah, Your Worship, my board is very clear. We will not participate beyond March 31st. That's that's the cutoff date for my agency to participate. Thank you. Councilor uh, Zelensky. Th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, again, uh, I, I'm at a quandary here because, um, oh, because I'm a paper person. So, so without the rules in front of me, without how it's going to be run, and I don't know who's going to be doing the monitoring unless uh, one of you guys are going to be walking by there every day. Um, so, I, you know, we we got to figure out how it's actually going to work. And without all that details in front of me, um, I, I'm not going to support this. I do hope that we get answers in our our meeting. And I well, 
and I do hope that the discussion does go to the regular meeting. Um, but for me personally, without those things, I can't uh, recommend to council without those documents in front of me. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Um, I, I hear your concerns, Councillor Zelensky. Um, we're just recommending a referral to the um, to the regular meeting of council, and if there is an issue that's not satisfactory to your um, way of thinking as a result of discussions that, that may happen in, in camera, um, then I think the more appropriate opposition vote would be at the regular meeting of, of uh, council tonight. That's my, not telling you what to do, but just recommendation. Councillor Zelensky. Uh, then, then possibly a friendly amendment. Uh, the community of the whole, um, uh, what um, forwards the discussion on suspending the enforcement zone was to the regular meeting. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. okay, that's taken as a friendly, soon to be amended amendment. Um, while they're typing, uh, Ms. Palmer. I, I'd just like to go back to, I, I think you'd be surprised, Ms. Burden particularly, just how much of the community would be in support of many different things. It's how this one has taken place, once again, that has got the community up in arms. I think the reality is that if um, an arena had been opened up, if a school had been opened up, if the churches had stepped forward, you would have had full support in all of this. But the fact that you're dealing with um, a, a, a person who has a legislation or um, litigation against City Council, the fact that the bylaw doesn't even come close, and the fact that our mayor just arbitrarily opened it up against all the rules and regulations, um, and which leads a lot of people to ask why he isn't also stepping down. Um, I think these are all serious concerns within the community, and um, I was watching and monitoring uh, Facebook quite closely last night, and yes, there's the odd person that does come up with some pretty crappy things to say, but the concerns are all about not proper process one more time, not being transparent, not letting the community have a say, not letting the, I mean, you've got lots of community people that live in that area that are concerned for their safety. You had a, a man out there last night who basically beat somebody with a golf club last year, ended up in jail and burnt down half the buildings in this town. What does that say to everybody that lives in that area? Yeah, um, I do have a few things to say over all of these different things that have been brought up in this discussion. Um, one is that, as far as my research led me to believe, is that um, pretty much, I, I think the mayor or the council, if they felt that it was a state of emergency, then I think that they could declare it. And then it would be either the, the minister or the province to accept it or and back it up, or whether or not they would want to cancel it. That, that's what my research had told me. Um, as for some of the different bylaws and, and enforcement and the following the rules and process, etc., cetera, um, we do know, the council was well aware on, on numerous times about the infractions downtown, not meeting code and, and the zoning requirements downtown, businesses and different building owners down there. And it had been brought up more than once that none of them, I believe, have ever received a notice and most people don't want to complain because we don't want to see more people becoming homeless or putting more stress on the housing situation or further you know hardship on the business owners and so just because someone doesn't formally say you know here is a complaint because we don't want anything to happen to these people doesn't mean that you're not aware that there is a bit of a bias as far as my the way i see things uh between some of the rules you decide to enforce and the ones that you don't um, in regards to just the zoning bylaws in particular. Another I, uh, uh, comment is about the planning, the planning and the process, and how all of a sudden, again, it's ad hoc, as you like to say, or now it's an emergency. Yes, these discussions have been going on for some time, and a lot of times are round and round in circles uh, for different reasons. But, um, you know, people try to come up with a plan or they put forth a suggestion, and a lot of times, or they, 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 they try 
with actual effort to do something. And these efforts and these measures uh, get squashed or uh, blocked by some way. Um, and, and so there's been very little progress actually done on, on this front. Part of which, the reason why this is an emergency situation again, is because council has said basically that they did not want that building used and they did not want the, the, the one offer here. And so with those two things, knowing that that building in particular was one of the only ones available last year at this time and that's why it was, it was used, you knew that at the very beginning of all of these discussions. And yes, social services group tried very hard to find something other than that because we were told that you would not be in entertaining any option that included that building. Uh, you know, and, and as for the operator, someone stepped up and, and, they, and they took it on and they followed rules that, that were required at the time. Now you guys did not want that one and so anything that had them as an operator was also going to be squashed before it made, made it to the table. Um, now we have boundary services that it, boundary family services that are saying that they will do this. And excellent. This is good. This is something that we should be happy about. And yeah, no one's happy that it's happening now. You went as 20 below outside, and it was horrible conditions. It was awful for months. And yet people figured, huh, you know, it, it, that's okay. We did our best, which was not the best, because I think what the best you could do was what you were willing to do. It wasn't the best you could do, it was just what you were willing to do. And now, yes, unfortunately, regrettably, it has had to happen on an emergency basis. So yes, and in regards to um, the, the options with um, BC Housing, you know, some people haven't been exactly kind towards them either, but yes, they are, they apparently are going to help fund it, which is good, but they do need your, your say so. It always comes back to you guys. You, you do need to realize that, okay? Another thing is that it, it, most people in the community, you know, they don't think of a service provider being the one to decide that yes, this is what they're gonna do. <coughs> they look to you guys to say, you know, please take care of this. The average, you know, man or woman in their house that's up at night thinking, oh my God, is ever cold out there? The poor homeless people, you know? People are out there trying to live in this. They have no power to open up a, a building, you know? Some people have taken them into their own homes, which thank goodness, you know, for, the, for those people that could have that help, that's good, that's great. But that's not something that is sustainable either. And it, it, it doesn't serve everyone that needs it. Um, as for the, the issue with the, with the particular building and the court case that's involved, you know, that court case didn't come out of, an, uh, out of nowhere. And I can't speak to the legalities, but I know what I saw happen. And it, it wasn't really cool, you know. And if you guys were to maybe allow the uh, shelter to happen this winter, maybe you might be able to think of it as showing a little bit of goodwill and a little bit of non-bias or prejudices against that particular building or that home, that owner or the business. You might want to consider, consider that. Um, not only, you know, in that, but also some good faith about just community. Because I think there is a big difference in what other people in different differences in what people view as community right now. And if we're going to be a community, that means everyone. It doesn't mean just your community within your little clique. It means all of us. And just on a technicality, um, we have extreme weather shelter up there that was changed from cold weather shelter. Um, just because there are no definitions, and I know that's a bit of a sore point, and it, it is hard when you come to language sometimes, but the extreme weather shelter by the BC housing definitions, I think that would be the eight to eight, which most likely it, it, 
overall will not be suitable because it's cold out there right now you know and so it, that's why sometimes uh, the cold weather shelter I think is exp is more expansive where it's inclusive all all okay is that thank you sorry okay. for one. Um, uh, okay. Mr. Noseworthy yeah, I mentioned this last time I was up sorry um, I'd also like to speak to the wording of extreme weather shelter um, there is no definition of extreme uh, last year it was called a cold weather shelter and I personally drove by there and saw people outside tanning in the spring when the weather was far from cold it's supposed to be above zero again next week this shelter was opened on a forecast of the weather and it happened to happen but it can very easily be above zero again next week but we're saying it's going to be open until March if you guys want support from the majority of the people in this <coughs> town you need to treat it as a cold weather shelter and if it's not cold and no one's lives are at risk and no one's going to lose any digits then it shouldn't be open Okay, Councillor Zelensky. Yes, I did that. No, no, no. Thank you very much. Um, just a few comments again, again I guess. Uh, this council, this group, did show good faith. Last year, at this time, uh, the place was open. There wasn't an issue. And um, that was the good faith. Where the faith got lost is when a cold weather shelter turned up into a sunbathing area. That's where the good faith got lost. Mm. Um, and I can tell you for sure that, uh, and I'll just speak for myself, if Boundary Family Services said we'll be the service provider, if they said that six, eight months ago, well, we would have been all over it. Uh, I think and Councillor Thompson has mentioned that um, I'm gonna say this table, I'll talk for, for this table, we do have faith with that group. I think the community has faith with that group. But they, they came in yesterday at two o'clock, and that's the first time that, and, and still we have, again, no understanding on how this place will be run. So, again, <laughs> we have tried, you know, we, we do have a provider now. If back in January when we said, hey, we're showing good faith, we're letting the service operate in that building, and in January when it was brought up to say, hey, let's get working on definitions and get the zoning correct on this so it can happen and the public has their say, that still hasn't happened. So uh, a question to staff is we had a resolution here about definitions and uh, uh, things like that that was put off for uh, input from the public and we still haven't scheduled that, that um, or even designed on how that public is going to uh, feed into that. Do we have any update on when that's going to happen? I wish, you know, that uh, part of the problem was getting through the Christmas holidays and, and trying to figure out. Um, at this point in time, I believe Dolores is, is looking at, uh, has looked at whether we have it in a venue like we did at the curling rink for the other meeting, uh, and bringing out some of the definitions, some of the areas that we could look at. So that we don't have a, a specific date yet, but um, a lot of, uh, there's just other things that are kind of taking up dates uh, for both council and staff, but it, it certainly is a priority to get on to. Well, we have the package, we have the information, now it's really about just getting the public out. And getting the public out too close to Christmas is not going to be particularly helpful. Either. And budget as well, so those are the things impacting us. Okay, we are going to have to move this along, but Ms. Palmer? Um, in regards to the gentleman in the back, um, we had been um, brought up to speed with at the um, the advisory group that Councilgar, who has twice our population, was opening a six bed emergency cold weather shelter. And the way theirs run, six beds only for a population of over 7,000 people. Um, if nobody shows up by 10 o'clock, they shut the doors. And um, it's only open in emergency cold weather shelter. And I'm kind of wondering why a population of 4,000 needs to have a 24-7 shelter for less than five people that are actually at risk. Okay, that's a good answer. Uh, over in the corner, sir. Yes. Um, 
I agree with Ann, Ann Palmer. Oh, did you identify yourself? Oh, I'm Greg Skilling. Um, I totally agree with Ann Palmer. And there should be an extreme weather uh, facility only opened up when it's extremely cold. My understanding of that temperature is minus five. Um, right now, there's no rules, so I presume it's going to be a 24-7. Um, and who knows when these rules are going to come into place. It just boggles my mind how just, oh, it seems like overnight, this whole facility just, boom, it's all open. No rules, no nothing. It's just mind-boggling. That's all. I'm not sure if anybody yes, guessed uh, it. Yes, Councilor Corlett. I just want to say um, that I am looking forward to um, hearing further details in our next meeting. Because maybe that will help clarify things for Council and then we can um, go forward with other things. Okay. So, but I would like to see us move forward, uh, move ahead, and get on to our next meeting. Um, sir, if you could identify yourself. Don Gavins. Uh, Don Gavins. Yeah. Uh, my, being that we've come this far, can I suggest to council that they expand the word monitored, like by who, when, what? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's fine. Uh, through the chair. Um, we hope to like maybe get an answer by tonight by talking it over between staff and between different meetings. We have a full day, but uh, maybe we can give council a little bit better of an idea tonight at the meeting on that. Okay. Um, okay. What we're looking at is there is a motion to refer the discussion da -da -da, to tonight's meeting. Okay, uh, any other comments? Okay, uh, all those in favor of tonight's meeting? Opposed? Unanimous? Okay, that's it for that. Now we will move on to um, proposed bylaws for discussion. We have bylaw 2062 and 1623 slash R officer position establishment for corporate services. And we have a recommendation that we recommend the council to give first three readings um, at the regular meeting for these officer positions. And that uh, there's a further recommendation um, position or uh, sorry to we Appeal the bylaw 1623R and then I believe to replace it with the 2062. So, uh, does anybody want to make that motion so we can discuss it? Okay, Councilor Zelensky and discussion. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, uh, we, we have a copy of uh, the old bylaw 1623 in front of us and Again, it's, it's a bylaw. We've got uh, job descriptions there. Um, and I, I, I guess I have uh, two concerns. Um, is definitions, uh, trying to move away from contracts and be, again, transparent with the public as far as job descriptions and who's responsible for what. And that's not in this bylaw. And, um, and I'd like to uh, put your attention to, I've got page 21 of 26. Um, it's Schedule A under City Administrator. A clarification, is this, are you talking the um, 2062 or the 1623 that would be repealed? 1623, the one that we're repealing. Okay. Okay, so I'm on uh, the, the Schedule A, Powers and Duties, Responsibilities, City Administrator. Uh, bottom of the page, well, uh, uh, big pay paragraph, fourth one up. Uh, the city administrator recommends the hiring or dismissal of department head staff. So that, that comment is disappearing. Uh, the, the CAO and I have a discussion about this. Um, yeah, that, that, can, that concerns me, uh, to say the least. Um, 
comments, I guess, I'm asking for. Uh, yeah, Bob, yeah, if we can get a comment from the CEO. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the bylaws trying to do a number of things uh, is to try to, and it's been reviewed for, from legality, the types of things you don't necessarily want in the bylaw. Uh, but also there's a, the principle of uh, one employee, city council hires one employee, city manager, that person then hires the rest of the staff. And one of the difficulties under um, the older approach is that when you have employees that are beholding to uh, council as opposed to the CEO as individuals, as a council, as a body, uh, you end up with you could end up with divided loyalties, and so over time, the the notion is that um, you know council should be approving uh, through part of the budgeting process, the full, you know, the FTEs, the full time employees that you have on your on your roster. Council should be uh, reviewing the organizational chart and saying this is how the organization will be run and have that approval. Um, there are officers that uh, in legislation as a safeguard uh, are protected and if the CAO dismisses have a right to come before council, have an obligation to come before council and, and have their day in court so that in fact council, and that's, that's to protect the council and, uh, and, and the employees in, in those sensitive positions whereby um, you know, CAO fires a chief financial officer and council maybe wants to know why that sort of happened. And so the legislation ensures that that, that doesn't take place. So I think part of the, the issue is that organizations and, and you know, council have uh, been here a few months and we spend you know, a great deal of time uh, talking about issues that even 10 years ago a council wouldn't have been spending the time they did. So lots of emerging issues, lots of times people take on other duties and so it's really hard for those to be enshrined in a bylaw whereby every time you change uh, duty and something comes up and now all of a sudden a person gets tasked with that job you don't necessarily want to have to change that. Now that doesn't mean that council shouldn't be kept in the know. So as a CAO if I'm going to change a job and say okay from now on I'm going to merge public works with whatever uh, or take this function out of public works and put it in another area. I think that's, that there's a duty to inform council that that's because because now the organizational chart is, is being moved around. So so I think what this is really trying to do is not have every single change that occurs on a day-to-day -day basis have to come to council to amend. Uh, and, and it is in keeping with uh, other communities and how they're structured under the, the one city manager. So that's that's some of the difference. And so, uh, Your Worship, I think the, the concerns are, are legitimate, uh, but there may be better mechanisms to be able to deal with those things than necessarily have it enshrined in a bylaw in this way. I think, I think the most important thing in this bylaw is really just modernizing. And, and right now, I, I would argue that the, you know, the city has far too many people that are kind of officers that you necessarily need. Uh, in in uh, in place, and it's really those main ones that that, that should be uh, there. And, and as far as uh, anything else, you know, as, as you're well aware, uh, law is law. <laughs> and when it comes to the dismissal, you know, certainly council has to be made aware of uh, that it's happening. Not so much that it's a recommendation to fire the person to hire, but to be made aware that you're taking this action. If council has concern that at least the CAO would be prudent for the CAO to listen to the concerns of council, right? Yeah, Councilor Thompson. Um, just adding to that, to the, um, the act uh, only requires that council appoint the three. Well, two in, uh, in particular, that's the uh, corporate officer and the chief, chief financial officer, and the administrator is maybe and, and that's what's being reduced here. Um, and so I, I am in support of the, of the recommendation. Okay, Councillor Moslin. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. I, I too am in support of this. Uh, I know despite my writing habits that most of you endure, I love simplicity. Uh, the less is better. Uh, it allows us more latitude and to deal with more anomaly. 
rather than to have a very prescriptive bylaw, like the old one, that really will tie us in knots and is already outdated and would need to be constantly updated. I find that this bylaw, with its simplicity and its referral to the community charter, very clearly, uh, sections 147, 148, 149, where the job descriptions are laid out in legislation, that it provides a very simple mechanism for council to govern through its officers. However, I, I do believe, and I think this, our interim CAO has said it, that my expectation is that if the uh, internal structure of the organization changes, council will need to be informed and approved. I, uh, I'm apprehensive when jobs are so, uh, departments are suddenly moved around uh, 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 without uh, council being informed and at least having uh, opportunity for discussion. Nonetheless, I, I do support this uh, uh, modernization and simplification of what could be a very complicated bylaw. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Zelensky. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rayer. Um, and, and, and I do agree with that. And, and that's what kind of makes me nervous is we've seen department heads added in this organization without that discussion. We've seen uh, hours of work scheduled that were sh shuffled around without a discussion, and, and which should not happen. So, so it may, maybe good, good practices weren't followed, but as long as it's clear that we still have a say, a comment, a whatever into that organizational structure, I've got no problem. But that's not what I've seen in the past, and that's my concern. Oh, uh, no, uh, oh, uh, question whether or not the uh, fire chief should be added. Just throw it out there. Through me to you. Um, in, in reviewing, uh, in particular to that last question, um, in, in reviewing bylaws from other municipalities, because we don't just think we can, we should do a change like this without uh, um, consulting with legal counsel and with other municipalities. Uh, when, when, when this was put in place, I believe there was a time when uh, city council uh, made the management team more responsible, maybe acted without a quasi-CAO for a time here in Grand Forks. I, I, I'm not the expert on this, Mr. McKinnon. I just step out for a phone call, he would know, because I think his dad was involved at the time, and maybe Councillor Thompson was as well. So, so creating a bylaw at that time was possibly the right thing, where if you wanted to elevate managers as uh, to be reporting to council directly versus having a quasi-CAO in place at that time, this is a good solution. Uh, and uh, also, at the, this was this was at the time the Municipal Act was in place, and uh, this seemed to be the standard for what municipalities were doing. The Community Charter changed that, and uh, lots of legal cases came up. So, so legal counsel's advice uh, through the last year was to please, please fix this bylaw um, and and reduce it. This has been run through legal counsel. This has been we looked at the City of Kelowna bylaw, which this is largely based on. Um, we looked at all sorts of other municipalities. The, in one instance, I believe we had the approving officer listed separately in there. Um, this is the job title that's held by uh, Dolores at the time, which is appointed by council because I believe it must be appointed based on the uh, Local Government Act. Um, so so that, that's a, but it doesn't have to be defined in the bylaw because it's really the job description as per that act that somebody needs to hold that role within the organization. Um, do we need the fire chief in here? No, we do not. So it's one of these additional items. Um, it, it, it's basically meant to standardize, to clean it up, and to protect the organization from all sorts of uh, legal items. Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah, Your Worship, and just to add to, you know, a, a number of councillors have raised, you know, a concern that, that before there are major changes, council should be made aware of it. Council should be made aware of it. Uh, may I suggest that, you know, a, a, a better made way to do that is to itemize that within a council policy. We can draft a policy, and then it's a council policy, which, you know, in, inherently has as much strength as this. So if the CAO does not follow policy, council then, and kind of ask those questions, why it's not happening. 
And I think it has as much strength as a formal bylaw uh, that doesn't require the vote. And, and then we cover that, and the CAO knows that that's an that that's a expectation uh, by council. Okay, so we have uh, um, the motion to um, forward this to the um, meeting tonight for the um, repeal of the old bylaw and then a new one coming in. Further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, information items, none correspondence, none late items, reports, questions, blah, blah, blah. So we're down to question period from the public. Ms. Palmer? Uh, not question, just sort of two comments. I've been getting feedback um, from people that work and they're unhappy about the fact that they don't get to come to these meetings because they actually are paying and getting paid and then paying again. Um, so they can't be here. And is there some way that something could be done to allow them the ability to come to meetings like this? And I, I don't see how personally, but um, I'm just bringing it up there so you know. The other thing I'd just like to say is I would like to thank you, Mayor Crow. Uh, this is the first time I've come to a meeting where I've actually been allowed to speak without being shut down because I did not follow the other mayor's agenda. And it's very nice to know that I actually do have a right as a tax-paying citizen to actually have a say. Thank you. Further? Seeing none, uh, looking for a motion to adjourn. Uh, Councillor Moslin, all those in favor? <laughs> Meeting adjourned. Oh. <laughs>